Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The basis of our meditation this morning is from the gospel lesson just read. Hear these opening words yet again. And getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, their faith, not this man's faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. This is the word of the Lord. Each day in Jesus' life, well, it's a great adventure. He goes about his day, not sure exactly what will come up. Sounds about like you. Who knows when the phone will ring and who it will be? Probably just another telemarketer. Who knows when some event will come about to change the course and direction of how you spend your time that day. Jesus seems pretty flexible, accepting whatever his father sends. He was a people person, an others needs first kind of guy. As our Savior, he is in it for us. The day before this event before us today, a storm arose on the sea a great windstorm that threatened to capsize the boat where the disciples uh, were at. We know a bit about storms, don't we? Storms on the sea these days. And we are troubled as a people by how many people died and the destruction the storm in our country caused. We've been to some of those places that we've seen on the news, and we know people also who have lived there or been there. Jesus stands on the bow of the ship and he rebukes the wind and the waves and there is, as the Greek language says, a mega calm. Through this, the disciples' understanding of Jesus as a miracle worker and a prophet is increased. Even the waves do what he says and do his bidding. Who is this man? They respond. Well, you and I know he is more than a man, this Jesus, this Jesus as true man is also our God come to save us. For on the cross, on that wooden cross, he will spread his arms out on the bow of that mighty ship to still the storms of all of us who are in and with him, the storms of the Father's wrath against us on account of what our sin has caused. He will stand yet again and rebuke the wind and the waves and the sin and Satan and death and bring us to the safe haven of rest. Next, Jesus' boat docks at a spot in Gentile territory where two demon-possessed men are terrorizing a local village. It's a rather interesting account. These Gentlemen, if I might use that term, probably an incorrect term, live in the cemetery. And the Bible says that they're so fierce that no one can travel in that area. Uh, while Matthew's account records particular details, we know from other accounts that the men of the city attempt to chain these individuals to the tombs to no avail. Living in that region is hindered because of what Satan has done. Satan causes so much ruin in our world, and it affects not only individuals, but all individuals who are under his sway. Yet Jesus, with a mere word, does what no one can do, no one in that village can do, and the demons flee. Yet most interesting is the reaction which is enough to make you astounded. The entire town comes out to Jesus where he is and asks him to leave. He has just fixed their problem, brought the men to a right mind. Never mind the herd of pigs that was drowned in the sea. And yet we see that these people prefer darkness rather than the light. Recently, someone 
explain to me why after the Dobbs decision and the fall of Roe v. Wade, the tide of pro-abortion legislation has swept across our country. You know, it used to be that politicians got votes by, you remember how the phrase used to go, shaking hands and kissing babies? Yet now politicians get votes by shaking hands and promising to give their support to the killing of babies. Well, why? It does not make sense to us, and yet we should understand this. We ask too much. It is not just a vote for a child. That vote challenges, you must understand, an entire worldview, what our society has made our lives about. We don't ask an easy thing, but are asking them the world to have a change of mind and heart, something only the Lord can affect. Yet how often have we been in those shoes too? We have not wanted to follow the cost of discipleship of what our Lord has asked. Following Jesus, it's not an easy thing. Jesus seems to lose, and it seems in that, that way in our world too. Jesus seems to lose as his boat leaves the shore, as he does what the people have asked. Or so it seems from our perspective. But you must understand that the two men are there. Just two, but they are there, bearing witness to what Christ has done for them. The candle shines in the darkness. Jesus then makes his way home. The ship steers to the familiar place. After travel, it's always good to come back and sleep in your own bed. Yet right away, men bring an individual to Jesus. Sometimes you should understand in the Gospels that people come to Jesus on their own accord. The people who come on their own with a sickness or a disease are like us. We're Christians. We've been converted we know who our Lord is. We get into trouble. We have a problem. We know the solution. And we ask the Lord for help. We go to the Lord and we cry to him for our own needs. We come to him in this place or in prayer at home. But there are a whole lot of people who don't know the solution as we do. They never stop to pray for themselves. They may not even believe. They may be hostile to the faith. There are two categories of stories in the Gospels that help with this. There are a whole number of accounts where individuals bring needs when people can't come to the Lord. They come to the Lord and pray for their sick or tormented children or those that they know who are near death. When people won't come, we pray. We come to Jesus. And we bring them to Jesus, even though they don't come of their own accord. These accounts represent our continuous petitions for those suffering from ailments of body, mind, soul, or demon. We have a job to do. When we come to church, we have people in our mind. We carry their needs before and place them at his feet. But there is another category of people those who are brought to Jesus, but who of their own don't yet believe in him. We may ask someone, do you know Jesus? And as we speak about the Lord to them, Christ is there. We want them to come into contact with him. We want them to meet our pastor, to read a devotional that we give them, or to come to church. So if you have people like that in your life, like that, who don't believe, but you're introducing them to the Lord, here is a story of just that. There's a group of friends, there's around four, who do the very hard work of bringing this man to church. It literally is a group effort. This man does not believe. They believe. He cannot walk. They can. It's not so easy to bring him. It's not easy to have people you know not love Jesus. In a way, their lives are like this man who's paralyzed. We're paralyzed when we live life without God. 
without knowing the love of Jesus, who died on the cross for us, we cannot know God's love for us. It is his love for us, his forgiveness of our sins, that awakens our love for him and our response of love to others. Lives are paralyzed by the darkness of this world. But back to this man. We might ask the question, how can Jesus say, be of good cheer, son, your sins are forgiven you, when the man himself doesn't even believe? How can Jesus speak words about forgiveness, saying to the man that the man is forgiven when he himself doesn't even know Christ or believe in him? We Lutherans believe and understand something that the Bible teaches. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for the sins of the entire world, not just the sins of the elect. There are a group of Christians called Calvinists who believe in something called limited atonement. We believe in atonement that was not limited. One does not have to wonder in life if one is part of the elect and therefore that your sins are atoned for. One merely needs to understand and know that Jesus died for all sins, the entire world's sins, and that I am part of that world. So that means that Jesus has died for me and he's covered for my sins also. You're not forgiven on the basis of whether or not you believe or do not believe. You are forgiven because of what Jesus did on a Friday in April in 33 AD. Don't look inside of you. Look outside of you to the cross. Your forgiveness is an objective fact. Faith receives the gift, sees what God has done, and appropriates it to the self. So Jesus proclaims the gospel to this unbelieving man. Jesus says, I'm going to the cross for you. Simply believe it. This man goes home, yet Jesus goes to the cross. In a real way, Jesus takes our place. Jesus suffers for our sins. He takes our sins, and we get what he won. He goes to death, we go to life. Surely he took our sins and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him not. He took our rebellion and the curses that we gave, and he loved us. Jesus, though, forgives this man first before he is even healed. What is needed most in life is not necessarily the things that we think that we need. It is the knowledge of Jesus coming and sharing the good news that your sins are forgiven. It may seem rather beside the point that this man has a real problem of paralysis that Jesus does not first deal with, but the healing will come. And more than anything else, to know you are forgiven by Christ means having what you need to live. We have the good news of Jesus' presence. Christ is here, and he begins the time with us today, saying to us that our sins are atoned for. This man, through that interaction, comes to believe in the Lord and in his power. The faith of his friends becomes his faith as well. Jesus has given this power. That forgiveness came down from heaven through him. It was won and given by Jesus, and it is now the message that we give. Jesus instituted the office of the holy ministry, and he instituted the holy Christian church so that repentance and forgiveness of sins might be preached in his name to all nations and peoples. Even in the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, we say at the center part, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I believe in one baptism that gives and remits the forgiveness of sins. The knowledge of our sin leaves us paralyzed. We're unable to work. We're unable to do what is needed in our lives. We receive that forgiveness, though, from our pastor and from people in our homes. It's a message that we need to constantly hear. God gives it to us for us to extend it to each other. Adam received it from Eve, and Eve gave it to Adam. Because God forgave them and would send his son Jesus, they could live. They clothed each other with forgiveness. We can live in forgiveness in our homes. We don't have to wait until people apologize to live in forgiveness. We forgive them 
because Jesus has done it for us. And how Jesus has done it is how we forgive others long before even they say that they are sorry. The key to forgiving them and forgiving a world is not that they say that they're sorry and then we forgive them, but that Christ has died for them, that it is an accomplished fact, that it has already been forgiven a long time ago. We live from this event of the forgiveness of sins, one on the cross, demonstrated in the empty tomb by which our sins and all, our, all tombs stand open. We don't live showing kindness only to the repentant. We live from the established fact of the reconciliation of the world from the death of Jesus. It changes how we live even for the sinner, the demon-possessed, and the evil, wicked world. People's reaction is quite beside the point. They are the Lord's if they see it or not. We see Jesus' resurrection, and that fact changes everything from that point onward. Jesus lives, and we want others to know about it. We live from Easter and a tomb that is opened for the world. What if you lived knowing this, that the future was covered and that heaven was yours? What if you lived with the knowledge of the one who came to you and poured out his life for you? Well, the Bible says simply that this man went home. We think about that word even as Jesus went home, even as we think about our eternal home and our heavenly home and our, our homes that we go home also today to. Jesus sends the back the man forgiven, not paralyzed anymore, home renewed, forgiven, and restored. And the Lord sends us home that way too. We are forgiven. We are renewed by what Jesus has done, and we are restored by the forgiveness that is won for us by Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of God which passes all human understanding. Guard your hearts and minds through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen.